Have you ever thought about why you can actually feel the air whenever you stick your arm out of a window or swing your hand really fast? That's because it's actually full of these tiny particles that we breathe in and then we actually compress to make the sounds that you're hearing me make right now. This topic is tested on the MCAT, but most importantly, the assumptions that we make about those particles are tested. I'm about to demonstrate all the strategies you'll need to be successful in the MCAT and show you how to get every question correct. I'll do that using those gas assumptions. Let's take a look at it. The first thing I notice when I look at this passage is how small of a passage it is for chemistry and physics. And usually when they have a smaller passage like this with very minimal writing, it's going to be on a subject that you probably already know. For instance, like the ideal gas law here, which this one is about. And they're going to ask you some really thought-provoking questions about subjects that you should theoretically be familiar with if you're taking the MCAT. There won't be a ton of questions that you can actually pull from the passage. You're gonna have to put your science cap on. But let's see what we can get from the passage. Starting off, it says the movement of gas particles in and out of the lungs can be explained using the ideal gas law, I told you, which relates the pressure, volume, number of particles, and temperature of gaseous samples. Okay, so obviously one of the basic sciences that we're paying attention to here is gonna be the ideal gas law. Instead of actually writing that out, I'm just gonna write out the formula. Pivnert, PV equals NRT. So that goes ahead and relates all those variables as well. When movement of particles into the lungs is required, lung volume is increased, resulting in a pressure decrease. That's pretty obvious. That's just applications of this formula. If all this is going to stay the same and volume goes up, pressure has to go down and vice versa. Movement of gas particles into the expanded lung volume allows the pressure inside the lung to become equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. The ideal gas constant R relates to four parameters. So they're just using the ideal gas constant and talking about how it's related to respiratory physiology. The ideal gas constant R can be found by measuring the volume that a a given amount of gas occupies at a certain temperature and pressure. One technique for accomplishing this is to react a known amount of magnesium with acid to produce hydrogen gas. So they just keep talking about this equation. I mean, they're giving you like all the variables for it. And then they're telling you that there is a way to actually measure this gas constant. Apparently, this is how we found it. And that is reaction one. So I'm just going to say reaction one because that shows that that's the purpose of it and now it looks like they're going to explain how to do this reaction something we were all curious about a piece of magnesium ribbon was wound up and suspended in the opened end of a 50 milliliter burette which would probably be like the top if you're holding a burette like i held one in gen chem down here the burette was then inverted into a beaker containing 100 mils of water vacuum was used to suck the air out of the tip of the burette filling it with water from the beaker air was then allowed in through the tip of the burette until the water level decreased the 50 milliliter mark the highest mark on the burette then 100 mils of hydrochloric acid was added to the beaker after the magnesium ribbon was completely reacted the water level was red the difference between the two readings was the volume of the hydrogen gas produced. So what they did is they just put this burette with this ribbon into a beaker filled with water and then they sucked all the air and the additional particles out of it letting it out to 50 milliliters. Then they added 100 mils of hydrochloric acid and they said that if we notice a difference between 50 mils and whatever happens after the reaction, that difference is due to the volume of the hydrogen gas being produced. So we can use all of this to approximate the ideal gas constant. And that's it. That's a really quick passage. It really doesn't tell us a ton. But let's look at these questions and see just how in-depth they get. The first one says, what type of reaction is reaction one? All right. So that is referencing this right here, which we start with an acid. Now we react it with this magnesium metal and we get magnesium dichloride and we get hydrogen gas. So let's look at the answer choices and see what they wanted here. Which type of reaction is this? Is it an oxidation reduction reaction? Okay, so you usually see like hydrogens moving here and it's also like one of the most tested reactions on the MCAT. It probably is the most tested reaction on the MCAT. Um, and so if I see hydrogens moving, I see redox or reduction slash oxidation as an answer choice, I'm probably going to click it. Um, and we do see hydrogens moving here, right? And that would actually be the first thing the first thing that would have to happen before this magnesium bound to the chloride would be that the hydrogen and the chloride bond actually broke right and that would oxidize this chloride so that would be the first thing that would happen um, so I do like answer choice a B says Lewis acid slash Lewis base technically you could argue for that because we are making a salt here but again in order to make that 
salt between the magnesium and the chloride, then you have to free up the chloride first. The first thing that happens is going to be the redox reaction. So maybe not to B. Um, I don't know that B would be incorrect, but A happens first and it's the most tested reaction on the MCAT. So I would go with A. C says a double replacement. We don't end up with a double replacement because this hydrogen actually just ends up binding with itself. So maybe not to C. And then ionization. We don't see any ionized elements here. So maybe not D. And the correct answer would be redox reaction, which it usually is. If you, Especially if you see some hydrogens or, or like oxygens moving, it's probably going to be redox. Number 23 says, suppose that at the end of reaction one, the level of the aqueous solution were 26 centimeters higher inside the barrette than outside compared to ambient pressure. The pressure of the gas inside the barrette would be what? If that confused you, draw it out. We have this barrette and then we have this beaker. They said that after the reaction, we're going to raise the level. Do you remember when we went through the passage, we saw that if we increase the level or decrease the level, it was due to hydrogen gas. So the volume of hydrogen gas. So that means that we have an increased volume inside of the barrette. We have an increased volume. What do we know that means for our pressure. Increased volume is equal to decreased pressure, as long as you're keeping all this the same. So let's take a look. A says lower. I mean, yeah, volume's going to go down, or I'm sorry, pressure's going to go down. So sure, A. B says the same. No, it's going to go down. C and D are both referencing increases. So maybe not C and D. So the correct answer would be A. I know that there would be a tendency to freak out if you're the type of person that looks at the answer choices before you actually think about what the answer to the question should be, because you would see these numbers and you would think, oh crap, how do I get numbers out of this? You'd probably start trying to do something with this 26 centimeters higher and maybe you would panic click D. But notice the MCAT just tested you on the really simple science of volume goes up, pressure goes down. And that's usually how they do it. They usually don't ask you to do a ton of numbers. They're really moving away from that model and so are things like the step exams that you'll take in medical school. Number 24 is an easy one. It says how should the ideal gas equation be rearranged to most easily use the values from the experiment in the passage to calculate the gas constant? I.e. how do you isolate the gas constant? So if you know your equations here, which you should, then it's just simple algebra how do I isolate R the way that I would do that is divide both sides by NT and then I would say R is equal to PV over NT which is answer choice D and the last one says, what was the major goal of the experiment in the passage? They actually told us this, right? And we kind of alluded to it in our flowchart. We said that we can find this ideal gas constant using this technique. So using the technique of reaction one. So whenever we get asked, what's the major goal of the experiment? The whole experiment was reaction one. So it has something to do with finding or measuring the ideal gas constant. A says to evaluate the molar mass of H2 gas. Nope, that's a periodic table. B says to study the mechanism of reaction one. Nope, it's a very well known reaction. And we didn't even look at the like organic chemistry of it or even the inorganic chemistry of it. So maybe not B. C says to determine the measured variables of the ideal gas law. Yeah, for sure, right? That's what we're doing here. I mean, if I could literally replace this here with R and it would be saying the same thing. So I like C. And then D says to study the reactivity of magnesium with acids. No, we did react magnesium with acids, but that was not the goal. This right here is a cop-out answer choice. Uh, you'll see this on our video called Recognizing Traps. And if you're curious about how to do any of these strategies, like how I'm simplifying the question or rephrasing it every single time I, I read it, um, how I'm actually making these flowcharts, even though this one wasn't very involved, or how I'm going through the passage and actually pulling out the relevant material and how to do that in a timely fashion, make sure to check out the strategies playlist that we do. So yes, when you wave your hand in the air, you hit particles and we get tested on the assumptions that we make about those particles. If you liked the video or you learned something new, make sure to subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments below how many of these questions that you got right. I'll see you next time.